Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. What's up, y'all? Missing in Chicago is um, the labor of love that Sarah Conway and I have been working on for the past two years. It really started with a project that I lead at the Invisible Institute called Beneath the Surface that I'll talk a little bit about. We found some complaints. I was like, Sarah, we need to talk about this. We need to um, do a deeper dive into this because something is not adding up. Um, And Yeah, I I think it also came from a lot of curiosity. Both Mm -hmm. Trina and I, um, as journalists, as individuals, as Chicagoans, were very interested in the connection um, between gender and how you move in the world, um, particularly with the criminal justice system. We both had a lot of interest in, you know, uh, policing and gender, um, prisons and jails and gender, and our reporting and just, you know, being, you know, active community members in Chicago, we had talked to a lot of people impacted by those systems. And so we went into the project knowing that when you interact with police or you go to jail as a woman or a femme person or you go to prison, that there are specific things that happen to you because of your gender. And so we were really interested in examining, I wanted like the project with a lot of curiosity of like, you know, and we'll get into it, but what happens when you go missing in Chicago and what are, you know, the things that are connected to your experience as you sort of move through this pipeline that both has data Mm -hmm. and then does not have data as we discovered. Zooming a little bit backwards to tell you about how we even got to complaints, right? In the um, Charles Green, uh, uh, black man who was incarcerated for a murder he didn't commit, submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for a public records, underlying documents for all missing, per- all complaints, allegations of misconduct going back in time. At the time, the Invisible Institute, where I'm data director, already housed the Citizens Police Data Project. I don't know if y'all are familiar with it. I'm sure that it, it certainly was talked about at Shy Hack Night um, in the past, but also like, is this repository of data spreadsheet level information related to a police misconduct record? But as you know, all the information that is a part of a police misconduct record isn't going to live in that top level information, right? So you're going to get some primary category. You're not going to see what the underlying narrative is. For example, if you have an, um, an encounter with a negative encounter with police, you may have a list of five allegations, whereas, you know, false arrest, excessive use of force, maybe they searched your body and they groped you. Um, that complaint may be categorized as a legal search or excessive use of force. And so, like maybe 2019 or sometime I kind of came up with, I in collaboration with the human rights data analysis group was like working to investigate sexual violence at the hands of police. And then I met Patrick Ball from HR DAG and he was like, you're trying to do machine learning with your brain. Let me talk to you about it. And then, and then, and then like Charles Green, all these underlying documents. So it's like, we got a heaping pile of underlying documents that could give us access to this context that lives underneath these complaints, right? A complaint operation and personnel violation, you, um, which like is basically like failure to provide duty. Could we, we could look deeper and see like in what context, you know, what, what are the things that connect people across space and time? And so I'm going to start with the documents pipeline team because like, that was the work of like um, Matt Chapman, other folks at Lucy Parsons Lab, and, and co- it was like a big collaborative brain brainstorm where we were, you know, parsing through these underlying documents. Some members of my team, we identified some report types where we knew the narratives lived, right? They lived on the face sheet. They lived in the, you know, there are these um, maybe like seven different report types that we identified that we decided we would target for scraping. Once we had access to, you know, this narrative text, we paired it with, I think that narrative text was about 30,000 allegations, like narratives connected to a specific complaint record. We um, we d- did a topic model, right, in order to kind of um, 
organized the metadata associated with the complaints. And then we like had a group of people who were volunteers. We had up to 200 volunteers who labeled allegations um, and they met on a weekly basis. The goal was, right, we're going to train this algorithm, which we friendly friendly like we um lovingly named it judy right as judy feels like the nosy auntie who's gonna read all your business and tell you about yourself um and the hope was right this classifier would spit out a score that is connected to a specific selector you know the higher the score the more likely that it's relevant to the thing right but what was really important about that piece of work was the inter-radar reliability that all of our volunteers were actually agreeing on what the label for the complaint was. We had selector LGBTQIA, home, domestic, sexual violation, right? Different, different things we wanted folks to label the documents as. And um, in order for us to build really good training data, we had to really tweak that annotation dictionary over time to ensure that inter-radar reliability was like on point. And then we also, as we got like an influx of volunteers later on, we flirted with the idea of like waiting expert volunteers. We um, contemplated putting different weights on, on that, right? Because like ultimately there was a group of everyday people who were coming to a space. They had like a, a Google spreadsheet with 75 narratives in it associated with specific, um, you know, unique ID. And then they had to learn about like, what does it mean? What is a binary, what is binary code? Like relevant or not relevant? You put an X in it if it's this and you don't put anything in it if it's not. And then at the end of that conversation, they would be in dialogue with each other about how gruesome the stuff that they were reading was and and um and so ultimately right the the, the um, this this part of the project was like an opportunity for this participatory machine learning like how do we bring humans with us how are we like leaning on talking with being in conversation with impacted populations because even if you have never filed a complaint against the police you literally live in a society where all of these systems are working together and you may experience a missing loved one you may experience being stopped by police and feeling like they slighted you you know you may know someone who this has happened to you may know someone who's been incarcerated before and and never talked talks about what happened to them. Um, well, within the complaints, right, there were 54 allegations that fall underneath the umbrella of the selector called neglect, right? Annotation Dictionary said for any case that someone called police and they mistreated them, they were, you know, they da 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 da, da. This is relevant. So this is where you place the X. Um, and um, missing in Chicago, 50, these 54 allegations of misconduct, you know, we saw a range of complaints. We saw, you know, a DCFS staff member saying that an officer had prematurely closed a case before their loved one was found. We saw many mothers complain, filing complaints, specifically black women filing complaints about their black children and the tr mistreatment that they had faced, attempting to file a missing person report and being denied, being laughed at, saying, oh, you mad at your baby daddy, right? Some of these types of things that people only, only see and understand and talk about anecdotally, but are not always able to get into to by data and so again coming coming to this place of um you know not only did we you know look through these police misconduct records but then it was like okay well let's look at missing persons cases themselves what is it the cpd data look like here we know back in the day they said we investigate these cases across a race and sex um, zip code, the same. But when we looked at the missing persons data, we actually saw that over five years, 45% of the officer response time was missing. And nearly 100% of the cases were labeled as closed, non-criminal. We were like, hold on, that doesn't make any sense, especially in, in parallel with these police misconduct complaints. So we started talking to people. And not only did we talk to people, but we looked at other data sets that we felt were relevant to the issue. That's medical examiner's data. That is Cook County Sheriff's Missing Persons uh, Project data. That is um, 911 calls. And we, we, ultimately by way of talking to uh, like dozens of family members um, has some really heavy hitting findings about the way that Chicago police handle these cases. You want to take that? Sure. Um, so with the 54 complaints and kind of segueing into, into sources, um, you know, we started this project, huge topic, missing persons, and we really wanted people and the data 
and then people interacting with the data and then us kind of cross-referencing data. And we wanted that to inform what the story actually was. Um, and so those complaints were really important because we saw started seeing like a through line that there were, um, when we, that we coded them, we saw that they were often, as Trina mentioned, mothers making complaints about when they went to file a missing persons claim for their child, but it was like people were being told to wait 24 hours or 48 hours. It wasn't just one person. We saw that that made up many of the 54 complaints that we had. We also saw that when families would interact with police officers, police officers were extremely verbally abusive to them. They would say, you know, things that were personally insulting. They would tell them that it was their fault that their child was missing. Um, sometimes they would literally just drive away and leave a parent on the road. Um, and we also saw that, you know, people were dissatisfied with the quality of investigation work that the Chicago Police Department was doing. So when we went into and we started interviewing families, we were like, you know, just keeping our ears kind of up, like, what are people going to say? And we started hearing from many, many families that they had actually experienced similar things. Um, and so, like, I found that that part of the project, you know, the machine learning was really critical because it wasn't everything, but it did identify, like, here are some core things that you know, it's not just one person saying this, like it is a group of people who have made this about a specific thing. So we went into talking to families and the, the, you know, topic of our investigation, missing persons, extremely sensitive topic. Most of the people that we talked to, some of them had currently had a loved one that was missing. Others, they had a loved one who was missing, who was um, ultimately murdered, or they don't know what happened to the person. So it was a group of people that we knew even before we talked to folks that there was a lot of trauma and a lot of pain and that people have coped with that in different ways. But we wanted to be extremely mindful of, you know, uh, doing, even though the story is very rooted in data science, like really using a human touch with it to realize that we were talking to people who have both been silenced by the Chicago Police Department and have experienced a lot of neglect from the state. Like they did not get the services that they pay taxes for. Um, they didn't get the services that they expected they would get. Um, and oftentimes they were left with no answers. So to kind of, that's, you know, how we sort of went about. Um, one of the things that we found as we were talking to families was that police officers were prematurely closing cases. How do we do that? Well, we use records requests um, after kind of identifying case, unique case ID numbers through the missing persons data. We went and we started doing Freedom of Information Act requests for all of the the Here's a hack tip, okay? Ask for, <laughs> sorry, I'm, not, I'm like very honored to be here because I'm not in, yeah, anyway. So um, we asked for the handwritten documents and the digitized documents because I will tell you they are not always the same. And there's things that you can see it, that officers and detectives write in their own handwriting that don't show up in the digitized ones. And that's because a lot of stuff at the Chicago Police Department is still done by hand. Uh, the missing person stuff. Right. Missing person stuff. So the missing persons reports are the last form that we know of that has not been digitized by the Chicago Police Department. Um, talking about sourcing, you know, we talked to a ton of people. We also talked to a lot of police officers, um, many of whom would talk to us off the record or anonymously that, you know, they also shared a lot of frustrations with the system, the, the pipeline for missing persons within the Chicago Police Department. We talked to a lot of cops and people that are very high up at police departments around the country. We made a list of like the largest police departments and actually just reached out to them. Everyone but NYPD talked to us. They were like, they were, they just ignored us. But um, we talked to people and we started to really understand the infrastructure of how does a police department operate and how... Um, common or normal is it that a form like that would not be digitized? And one of the things that we heard was like, that's actually really uncommon to not have it digitized. So one of the things that we found is that outside of, you know, deny, denying and delaying um, people from filing missing persons reports, which we found through our research is actually illegal by Illinois state law. Um, just so everybody in the room knows, like if you know someone who goes missing one day, you don't have to be related to the person and a cop cannot tell you to wait any amount of time. Um, and if someone's actually in danger, it's really critical that they start looking for them. Um, and we looked into their own, their archived um, uh, policy papers, uh, the directives, and we saw that it's actually illegal in their own directives to do that. So 
One thing that we started noticing when we would look into find all the underlying documents for a specific case was that we started noticing that um, people who were missing and then ended up being homicide victims because we had all the homicide data, we started noticing that detectives were actually closing some cases. The person actually never was found. Um, they never came home, but we would see in their own handwriting and underlying documents, they would say, uh, the complainant, we talked to the complainant, which is the person who makes the missing persons report, and they said the individual came home. One of those people was Desiree Robinson. She was 16 years old. Um, one thing that came up in our reporting was a lot of young people, a lot of teenagers. And so from talking to family members and really studying their cases, we saw a lot of teens are dealing with, you know, conflict with parents, sometimes just being on the internet. Um, which is a really scary thing to say out loud. And Desiree had run away. Um, she had also been on Facebook and she ended up connecting with adults who trafficked her. So they forced her to do sex work. Um, her grandfather had filed a missing persons report for her. And a detective prematurely closed that case. He said, I talked to the complainant. She came home. She's good. Um, and several days after he closed that case, she was actually murdered. Um, she was murdered by an adult man who um, was paying to have sex with her on Christmas Eve. Um, and we talked to her grandpa and we we're like, did you ever talk to a detective? And he was like, no, I never talked to a detective. And that was like not the only case that we found um, where they had done premature closures. Okay, so the earliest case of premature closure like obviously our the missing persons data that we looked at was between the year 2000 and 2021 and so in the early 2000s there's a chicago public school student shavonna prather who is she goes missing after work um april 19th that night the mcdonald's manager of her of where she worked he murdered her and her mother was furiously looking for her right um her on april 26th a detective wrote earlier, like maybe 2 p.m., missing has been located, victim offender, no, closed non-criminal, right? Two hours later, maybe three hours later, her body was found on 117th and Torrance. She had been there for so many days that moss began to grow on her body. There's no way that the detective spoke to her mother and her mother said that she had been found. Um, but even though her missing case had already been closed, um, you know, a homicide case opened. They immediately knew who killed her because it was very obvious, right? He not only, it was very clear, right? He, from his text messages to people, from the inappropriate relationship that he was having with her in the first place. Um, but yeah, she was, and she was three months pregnant. Yes. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like on paper, you're like, Ooh, look like the bad guy. We got them. The offender has been, has been taken, you know, has been, um, put in jail but ultimately like had her body not been found what would have come of her case other than it being you know closed non-criminal and this detective noting that she had actually been found and so you know as we're looking at the data we see all these kinds of discrepancies one you know nearly 100 percent of the cases are closed and non-criminal and then there are about 300 cases that we've been able to identify that were originally a missing persons report and were were reclassified to a homicide in the data in the missing persons data there's a column of course that says current iucr and many of them are 6050 which means missing non-criminal but there are about 10 of them that are reclassified in the data as a homicide. In the year 2018, for example, Daisy Hayes, her body has not been found, but a guy was charged in her murder. She clearly, you know, her, her, a guy was charged in her murder and he, he, he got off and that's a whole other thing. But her case was reclassified as a homicide. Marlon Ochoa Lopez, her body was found. Her case was reclassified as a homicide. You know, there are many, you know, there are cases where you, you don't even know, you know a homicide has occurred, but you, you know, a, you know a homicide has occurred, but, but it's, but, um, you don't know who did the homicide. It still changes. Joanna Wright, for example, was kidnapped. When she first started, she started as a missing person. New evidence came out that she had actually been kidnapped. Her case was reclassified as a kidnapping. And we see there were 10 cases that were reclassified as a homicide. As, as we're talking to families, we're, we're noticing that there are some families who we've spoken to who have 
missing and murdered cases, but their cases were labeled as non-criminal in the data, labeled as non-criminal in the data, even though a homicide case had opened up. And the, you know, we, you know, there are some names of these people, mostly women and, ch and children, honestly. And again, two of these cases were premature closures, but it, it, it called to question what kind of information not only, right, what is the pipeline for missing persons cases, you know, what, how are they differing in their directives being, you know, when their directives say when the missing, you know, when the missing is located, go to where the missing is. And they're not ever there. We have not seen that they're doing that. Um, but also it makes it challenging to, to actually realize that missing persons cases are deeply related to criminal things. In the cases that we identify, we're seeing lots of patterns that emerge young people dealing with mental health issues, folks who are struggling with substance use abuse, folks who are experiencing houselessness, people who, like, I mean, the, the list goes on of the kinds of things that people have in common that law enforcement weren't actually taking, um, although they have been taking note of them, um, it, the, the, the labeling of the data offers up and obscurification. Someone described it as corrupted data to me. Um, something that leads you to believe that like we don't have a missing persons problem at all. It just takes me back to again the city council meeting that happened in 2017 where CPD brass came in. They said look 99.9% .9 of these juveniles are returned or located. And the stat that they included when they spoke to city council included the case of Desiree Robinson premature closure. Included the case of um Sh um, Shavana Prather, which was a premature closure. Um, one of the things we did for those 11 cases that we got uh, t 20 years of medical examiner death data for Cook County, um, we would then, you know, oftentimes look up the uh, medical examiner number um, as a unique identifier and we would actually request the autopsy report. Um, from the uh, Cook County Medical Examiner. And then we actually went in and we read the full autopsy report to really make sure that, like, that these were indeed homicides. Um, you know, like some of our research initially did look at news reports, but there's... Uh, Every autopsy report, it will have like sort of a, a narrative section. So we go through and really learn about like what exactly had happened to this person. Is there any plausibility that this person was not murdered? Um, and we saw in a lot of these cases that, well, all of the 11, that that was actually impossible. Like they were indeed murdered by another person very clearly. Um, and, you know, we use that, I, I kind of bring this up is that like that didn't exist as a data point, but we used other documents then to, you know, with this list, running list of cases that we suspected were closed non-criminal in the missing persons data and that it become, were actually homicides and were not properly reclassified. We verified it through autopsy reports. I mean, that was something that like, you know, this reporting was really challenging. It's a very like heavy topic um, in general. And it was like, it was such a good thing to do with another person. Um, and just in general, like we can talk more about this later, but newsroom collaborations um, are really important, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. But right. yes. And so one case, one of the premature closure cases I felt was really important to know is this case of Mary Nelson, who right in her underlying document, you see, you know, her, her daughter reported her as missing. She came back. Um, the detective prematurely closed the case in her new underlying document. It says like, you know, woman came into the district. She says her mother still has not been found and that her case was closed. Yeah. You know, again, this, the same narrative. But what was interesting is that the RD number for that case, that new case that they opened up for Mary Nelson after the premature closure was not in any of the six FOIA requests that we sent for missing persons data over time. And so, you know, it's like when we saw the RD number, we got that, this this one specifically from the Cook, Cook County Sheriff Missing Persons Project is clearly a, you know, a CPD RD number. We submit a FOIA request for the underlying documents. It's clearly a missing persons report that has been filed, that has been suspended, right? But when you look at the data, it's not even represented in there. And we actually saw that over time as we, you know, we, we FOIA'd for the missing person data like multiple times over time because, you know, things, seeing the cases change over time. And then also, again, noticing that 
every so often we would get a sprinkle of some cases that we had never seen before, but that had, but that had happened like in the way past. And, and again, in the, in the example of Mary Nelson, her case is not even reflected in the new, in the um, underlying data that we have, even though, right, she was a person who was missing in 2008. Her daughter came back in 2018. It was like, hey, my mom is still missing. And and her case is not reflected in the in, from, in the data, which makes me feel like that within this kind of missing persons cases, and uh, aside from the people who are never reported missing, there must be some underlying set of missing persons cases that never even make it to 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 the to its digital to its digital data set form, um, most likely because it still lives in paper. Um, one one of the things, the last things we want to tell you about is um, because obviously, okay, we starting from like deny, delay of cases, all the way to a premature closure of a case. But I feel like what was really powerful about our project is that we also saw the ways that detectives investigated these cases, right? Aside from them victim blaming fam families, which is super egregious and, and, and deeply connected to bias and discrimination, at least that's what families are saying to us. We also saw that officers were fumbling evidence in the case. In the case of Sonia Rouse, who went missing when she was 50 years old, she was at some point a survivor of intimate partner violence. She had struggles with substance use abuse. She, she had postpartum after she had her daughter her mother actually began to raise her daughter and her mother described to us when her when Sonia first first went missing she went to the house where she was last seen she knocked on the door it was raining that day her her granddaughter Sonia's daughter was in the car in the back seat they had just come from church she files the missing persons report Sonia's sister you know, um, Bridget is actually at some point married to a detective. So she is, knows all the interworkings of, of law enforcement. And somehow the detective, Detective Yaversky on her case did not, he, he, he failed to, to even interview the guy that she was last seen with. And when we were looking at her underlying records, we saw that this guy was given an opportunity, the detective was given an opportunity to interview, you know, this the guy she was last seen with because he was technically incarcerated, but on a work release program. And the detective said, no, nah, I'll wait until he gets out of jail. The man was out of jail for literally approximately one year before he died of an overdose on the couch. And the detective who was on her case had no idea that this had happened. Even, you know, a year has passed. He's not making any movement. He had no idea that it happened until two months later when the family called it to his attention. Now, when we looked at that detective's misconduct records, we saw that he, on the record, right, he had allegations of busting his daughter's eardrum and breaking her tailbone. He had allegations of, abu of, of, of abusing his wife, right? And so it made us also really question and think about, you know, what are, what are the ways that we can look at police misconduct records and, and, and see the way that, you know, their allegations of misconduct can show up in the way that they are handling cases, right? Sonia was at some point a survivor of intimate partner violence. Is Was Sonia's case not investigated thoroughly because the detective assigned to her case was actually a perpetrator of violence against his own family? We, we don't know. We, we can't, we, we don't know. All we do know is that he never did. And that Sonia's mother feels like when he died, that was, there was, there's nothing left. No one else to ask. There's fresh paint on the house. All by the time, by the time the detective even knew that, that this guy had passed away. And so again, you know, just cl closing out that our, our, um, are this again this labor of love that we did together it really was demonstrated the importance of like okay we have the data we know that each of these data points are an single human being we know that black girls between the ages of 10 and 20 are extremely disproportionately impacted by the issue um and we also know that like each of these people's stories is embedded in communities who who um who who are grieving and whose grief spills over into communities on a regular basis. We, we also, um, 
I think we interrogated the data in a lot of ways, like cross-referencing police data with medical examiner data, cross-referencing police data with Cook County Sheriff data. Um, our own data yeah, like, looking at national data sets of missing persons. Like we never, and I'm sure like everybody in this room, we never assumed that the data was complete or correct. Right. Um, and interviews with families and autopsies and other ways, like were another way that we interrogated things. Um, to sort of, you know, push further and see what it actually looked like in documents and um, and data points. And so, thank you. Thank you. I neglected to mention a very important thing before we introduced our speakers, is that they won a Pulitzer Prize for this work. So congratulations to both of you and everyone who worked on it. So I guess I want to hear, uh, I'm curious about a little bit more about how non-standard CPD's response and CPD's lack of care for looking for missing persons compares nationally. So we don't have national data. So we can't speak to the national data. What we can speak to is that some missing persons units are nested in the homicide unit, likely because they know that when you go missing, there's a likelihood that you're going to go murdered. You will be, you may be murdered. Um, we do know that the digital, the form it not being digitized is going, it, it like super drags out the case because a B cop is filling out a piece of paper and then that piece of paper is, is shuffled to the area detectives. And then once it's finally shuffled, it might sit there before it is distributed. And, and people on television are talking about, you know, we in, in Chicago ourselves have had, first 48 missing missing persons where they say like the first 48 hours are the most critical and we've seen like it, you know the notification to the missing person section might happen but that detective being assigned to the case it might be some time before an actual detective is on the case um and another thing that we didn't um bring up but that was brought up to us is like families will you know a detective might it might be like a week or two weeks before a detective gets assigned Imagine you're a family, like you are calling CPD nonstop. Even you get a detective assigned, say you want to send over a tip. Like you're like, you should go here and collect CCTV footage. Like they don't answer their phones. Like that's one of a, a super common complaint that we saw that is people just calling and calling and calling and being told like the person's not working today or they'll call you back and they just never call back. Um, we can say that... Uh, in uh, Montana and Minnesota, there was two state task forces. So in Illinois, we actually are the latest state, I believe, to have a state task force to actually look into this issue and study it. There is a task force that's looking into missing and murdered women in Chicago. Um, and the task force is basically, it has some, uh, it does not have any active CPD um, members on it. It does have someone who was a former pretty high up guy at CPD who developed a lot of their data systems. Um, but it's, you know, some legislators, it has one impacted family, it has people who are advocates in the realms of um, domestic violence and human trafficking, because we found in our research, own research and reporting that those are deeply connected to missing um, persons. Um, so there's a state task force in Illinois, it's looking into this issue. In Montana and Minnesota, there were state task forces. So in Min and Montana was actually looking at how this issue impacts indigenous communities in Montana. Very similar to what happens in Chicago. They have a bunch of reports online. You can go and read them. But they did years of studying, talking with community members, um, talking with tribal uh, authorities, uh, the feds, all these people to kind of basically learn that like a lot of native communities in Montana, like when they reach out to police, they are not helped um, when their loved ones go missing, particularly women and girls. In Minnesota, there was also a state task force that was looking into the same issue, but in Minnesota, how it impacts black women. It ended up um, leading to the creation of the first office for missing and murdered black women in the country, which is actually really important because if you read through these task force reports, one of the things that they find is that families need oftentimes a place to go that is non-police. 
like an entity that they can kind of go to to be like, I'm not getting help. Could you interface with police for me? Um, or connecting them with services. Um, in uh, Minnesota, and specifically, they also are going to reopen cold cases. And they're going to reopen cases that are, you know, people who died by suicide um, or other cases that are sort of suspicious, which is stuff that came up in our own reporting here. So it's been, to answer your question, it's been interesting to see kind of like, while there is NamUs, which is like a national database, like we didn't study this, like, you know, how, comparing them to different police departments, but the task force and those two other states, like there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of like connective tissue between what those communities are experiencing and what we learned in our reporting here in Chicago. Interestingly, is um, that uh, Mayor Johnson and uh, some um, uh, members of city council, they introduced legislation to create a mayor task force to study this issue in Chicago. Um, and they're going to, uh, most likely in June, there's going to be a hearing before the Public Safety Committee. Um, and so that's like, you know, I think the most recent development we've we've seen on this. But in terms of CPD's response, I mean, like they, you know, we've published the story and they have not responded to it. Um, even though we really, you know, in depth studied their data, the Chicago Inspector General did though. They did put like um, they they planned. It was an A one investigation for twenty twenty four is to actually look into CPD's missing persons pipeline. Um, so, have you uh, ever tried to compare the successful cases with the ones that the police failed to find out, so that you could trace back to the cause, you know, correlation or the causation. Like if in a successful case, if the police responded in the first 48 hours and they found the person and they probably looked in a particular location or, you know, contacted a few people. And if you compared it with the fail, uh, you know, case where the police failed to investigate or whatever. And so that you could, you know, trace back to the actual, um, you know, machine learning point of view, if you could get the features extracted from the data set and say, you know, hey, you know, time is an important factor or location is an important factor or getting a history or something like that so you can compare it. That's a great question. So the problem is, one of the problems is that they are actually not keeping track of some of the really important data points for us to even measure how they are, you know, how much time, if we were to look at like by group, age group, you know, the amount of time that they're taking for their preliminary investigation before and notifying the missing person section before being, uh, having, assigning a detective. So we would have to drop all of those cases in an, in an attempt to do that analysis. But then it's like, how do we define a successful case when like, nearly all of the cases are labeled as closed non-criminal and then the cases that we are pulling that from because we started um you know we're pulling underlying records over and over again it's like um the definition of success is challenging to you know uh, to identify right in Desiree Robinson's case it says that she was located at a friend's i mean you know she was located spoke to the complainant she was located not a victim or offender would we define a success case as that underlying document? No, because we have the added context that she was actually being sex trafficked at the time. And so like, if there is a way for some kind of auditing of the, the um, underlying data to occur, I think especially with the task force happening, because they would have access to some of the names that are associated with missing persons cases, they could at the very least look at the names of people who had been missing and then the names of people who are now deceased and identify the reasons why they are deceased, if that reason is by homicide, if that is by accident, which includes substance use abuse, um, or if it is undetermined, which is cases that we, are, we were able to identify, um, were like cases where the families were like, this was foul play, and then medical examiners said, no, this was and this is undetermined, so we don't know, even though there was some kind of other evidence um, that indicated that um, someone had done something wrong. I think, like, another thing that came up around, like, data um, points that we wish existed is that um, I think at the heart of our story, like, we just want to talk about harm reduction. Like, we saw as reporters that there's a lot of things that could be done, like, very simple things, like collecting better data to understand, like, the public health issues that really drive missingness and homicide and violence in the city. Um, you know, just, like, anecdotally, like, people not having access to housing, um, underlying mental health issues, substance use disorder, 
um, intimate partner and domestic violence was like a, was an enormous part of this story, um, and and femicide. Like we really saw that there was just a lot of um, you know these missing persons cases were actually women and girls that were being deeply harmed and in some cases murdered. You know, so I think that when we're talking about police data, it would just be really good to have better data collection so we could just even understand like their response time. You know, like how long does it take cops to show up when a family calls? How long does an investigation take? What was the person going through? And there are police departments in the country that are like attempting to collect that. And we even learned, you know, through sources that within CPD, there's people in CPD, well, one person in particular who's retired, but like there has been efforts to actually collect that data. Specifically around like a trafficking screening, right? Like if a young person, if the definition, right, definition of success, someone returns, you, there is some kind of intake, you receive some kind of, okay, what happened to you while you were gone? Are you okay? You know, did you experience X, Y, and Z? Um, and then maybe keeping the data of, okay, does this person go missing again? Right? Where was that person found? You know, there, there are some specific features that you would want to define. But I think specifically in the, what you're talking about, like, collecting information around human trafficking so that we can actually better understand the issue. You know, in the third largest metro city in a country, a FBI-defined hotspot for child, child prostitution, which is legally, by, by definition, human trafficking, right? Like, what is happening here? Who is it happening to? If you look at human trafficking data now, it's literally... Nothing is like literally not many cases at all, but we know right people who are reported missing if we were to collect that data or even attempt to do some kind of intake process with young people, which again, like they have these directives that allude to these things, but like in action it's not actually happening. There are other data data points where it's like they have the ability to collect this information, but they're simply not doing it, which makes it very challenging to do some more deeper analysis, but w which helps us to know that deeper analysis is possible. Thank you for the question. So a lot of the cases you mentioned were closed and they said like a family member came in or something like that. And that's something that I've heard is common with a lot of like police cases or even like 3-1 cases. Is there any way like a legislator or something could change that process? So like if they say like her dad came in and said she was found that her dad has to like sign off or like the family gets notified of that the police are claiming that they came in. So, so first of all, one, like in their directives, it says go to the location of the missing. It, it does. It says that they're not doing that. So there's no legislation is going to to change that they're simply not doing that. And the reason why they're going to say they're not doing it is because they're going to say that they have too many cases. But then you're going to be like, well, how many cases is too many cases? And you'll start looking and you'll think like, well, actually, you could have actually gone to the location of this person. But then the other piece is in our reporting, one of the challenging things is we had to let families know that their case had been suspended. Like there were some families we're speaking to. They're like, oh, telling us about their loved ones. And they they have not heard from Chicago Police Department. We, they tell us their RD number. We look them up in the data, and it says that their case has been suspended. You know, the premature case closure of um, Desiree Robinson, like, that was a shock. The family, they didn't know. And so, like, so in some cities, they have dashboards where you can see, like, oh, these missing persons cases, and, th and this has now been closed, and so, like, now it's no longer on here. At least that provides some more transparency and accessibility. Some families in our reading groups have actually... Um, ask that like detectives should be even more transparent not only about the case status but about action taking on the case because many of the families even in the case of Morgan Fairley who who just went missing at the top of April um her the detective didn't even make contact with her father until two weeks later you know, he didn't even tell her father, oh, I've been assigned to the case. The, the, the family's calling, calling, calling. They want to know what has happened in the past two weeks since you've been assigned to my daughter's case. They, police do not legally have to tell you because they don't have to, they don't have to disclose those supplementary reports until the case is closed. And so folks have actually been asking for that kind of transparency. I would love to see that on a legislative tip. But then it's like, okay, what is the enforcement here? Because they're, they're not following their directives. They're telling people to delay their cases. And then also when they're closing a case, we just got a four-year request while we were sitting here. They're closing cases and they're not 
even for young people, they're not actually going to the location where the young person was. And they're saying, we found out through the complainant that this person has returned in good condition. But what is good condition? And, like, and, and, um, and who, what supervisor, you know what I'm saying? Like, what is the threshold for, well, I have too many cases. We need more detectives. It's like, well, how many, how many detectives are on it now? And how many cases do you have? And what is the proper caseload? Um, setting the record on some of these things so that folks are not just blindsided by excuses. I think one other thing about Morgan Farley's case, because I think it ties back to some of the stuff that we uh, had talked about, like findings in the story, is that um, you know, not only did a detective not contact her father for two weeks, this is a person who has no cell phone, who literally her father saw and then never saw her again, um, who has depression, who um, the family's deeply concerned over, who they've been doing their own detective work through like, uh, what's that group called? One of those like social groups. Oh, Black and Missing Foundation. Yeah, well, Black and Missing Foundation, but then also like it's like the neighborhood group. It's like one of those kind of creepy neighborhood, not them, but like you know, it's like the neighborhood app groups that they. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, no. So so folks have been utilizing the citizen app, citizen. neighbor, you know, um, the neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? Them those applications with like Facebook for your neighborhood. Yeah, tend to be you know discriminatory. So they um, but they've been using it and they've actually been collecting tips on their own because a detective has was not looking for their daughter or their sister and they're like okay we got a tip there's cctv footage how can we get a detective to go and get the cctv footage so like just to kind of contextualize that's actually what these families go through which is mind-boggling to me that it's like you have families doing detective work being like please just go get the footage and they can't get someone to answer the phone like that to follow a lead Mm -hmm. and that's the reality for a lot of people and you know the family members have a lot of concern over the welfare of this person. Like, what's happening to them? Where are they? What's going on? Is she being trafficked? Is she being trafficked? So it's um, it's heavy. it's heavy, yeah. Thank you so much for doing this work and for sharing it. And if I can say, too, the way that you talked about fairly complicated, not only policy, but technical methods for analyzing the data in such an easy to understand way, like probably deserves like a second Pulitzer, if I might say. <laughs> and um, that's kind of what my, my question is kind of about the, the methodology and like what it was like to like learn how to apply these techniques and like who you worked with and like how uh, clearly you're able to collaborate so effectively and like both, you know, here we run breakout groups where we try to do stuff like that, but also people here like work in those fields and do that. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what it was like to like learn how to do those things and like what went well and what what didn't. One, thank you so much. It's so hard to go through from the technical brain to the to the to the like journalism brain. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I have to be multiple versions of myself at once. Um, and so thank you for giving me that grace. It was really I have had the blessing to work in partnership with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. I don't know if y'all are familiar with them. Crew of statisticians, San Francisco, human rights. Um, and again, honestly, the year before, when I went to go get my master's in public policy from U Chicago, I went with the idea of, I want to do technical, I want to learn technical skills to investigate sexual violence at the hands of police. And then the summer before I went to school, Patrick was like, you're trying to do machine learning, but with your brain. And then he's like, come do an internship. And so I went to HR DAG the summer of 2019 and I first learned to scrape PDFs, I scraped open missing persons cases from 2000 to 2016. And it was really a big thing of like being organized and identifying a project that you really cared about, having that like desire to go home and eat a bag of um, red vines and smoke a joint. You know what I'm saying? And like, and you know, it's literally like that was, that was what happened. And then it was coming home, like developing the annotation dictionary, making sure to build small because like, because my, the technical brain doesn't always translate to everything everyday people attempting to like build community with folks who are like, we don't know anything about tech, but like, um, making sure that folks had this space to like actually talk about the heavy things that they had just encountered um, and be, and, and felt empowered and as if they were experts. And, and again, like um, 
we met, it was like on the weekly basis. We had like a stand-up meeting for 30 minutes. We were like, okay, this is what we're going to do this week. Meeting with the label volunteers who were labeling. When we first started, there were two groups. A group of younger women under like under the age of 35 on Tuesdays and then a group of women over the age of 40 in reading group B and they would meet on a regular basis they would label the same things and then they would see like okay what afterwards they would be like oh wait I thought that was oh I thought that was not with them being able to like edit their training data but to, as a means for us to better understand how to tweak our annotation dictionary so that we could all be on the same page and even then with the influx of volunteers right now we're like doing the training on zoom so it's not as personal but you you know bringing that to scale attempting to continue to keep it personal which that's why I'm such a fan of Shy Hack Night like y'all it's like so fascinating when people are, from different backgrounds are able to come together and feel invested. And I totally, you know, if you find a project that is like near and dear to your heart, even if you don't really understand something technical, the ability to play and explore with like your neighbors is so key. Um, and anytime anybody's doing that kind of work, I feel like it really brings us all to the future instead of making like AI, data science, whatever, inaccessible. I feel like you in the future, we're either going to see a world where people are basically not accessible to tech, but tech is just mining mining them and, and treating us like farms, or you're going to see people who are in a position to actually understand, you know, what the ways that we can leverage technology to even learn about our own behavioral behaviors and about our own traumas that are living inside of our personal lives. Um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you.